Hey everyone, it's uh, David Feinberg, and I'm really, really excited about the conversation we're about to have. I'm with a, a dear friend of mine, uh, a colleague, and somebody who I had the uh, honor to, to be involved in training, uh, Dr. Patricia Lester, a child psychiatrist, child and adolescent psychiatrist. And so let me uh, say hi, Patricia. It's so great to be with you. Um, and and uh, tell me what you've been thinking, what you've been working on, and how your work, um, I think, kind of dovetails right into this. Sure. Well, first of all, it's great to see you, David. It's been too long, and we miss you. Um, you're, I, I really look back at with fond memories on your leadership here at UCLA. Um, but in terms of our work with families and strengthening family and youth resilience, uh, we've been pretty busy. Uh, I think a lot of things have come up that have drawn upon our work with the military, actually, and thinking about how to support families during times of uncertainty and times of danger and worries about safety and risk. Um, as you know, our work is really focused on the concept of family resilience, really uh, how to strengthen family relationships and family functioning in the context of stress, trauma, adversity, not only to help families uh, make it through, but really even to be able to thrive and grow. Um, and it's really a different construct than individual um, resilience in that it is so focused on relationship and thinking about families in the context of the systems in which they live. So some of those systems are education and some are healthcare. Uh, they may be other uh, social support systems and then our collective communities around them. Explain the program and then let's talk how, how it is with COVID. I just, cause your results have been spectacular. Um, uh, and I just want people to get to know what you're talking about. Absolutely. So our program is called Families Overcoming Under Stress, which is the acronym is FOCUS. Um, and really, the, our approach has been in participation with uh, military installations, military families, military providers. We adapted um, in a very intentional way our programs that support families in all, all kinds of contexts and non-military ones as well. And so when we built Focus, it was really meant to be skills-based training um, that really focused on strengthening these relationships, whether they are co-parenting or parent-child, couples relationships, uh, sibling relationships, and really thought about the family as a whole, not to say you have a problem, but to say you have strengths, but how can we build upon those strengths? What kind of skills do you give them when you say communication or mm -hmm. resiliency or building on strengths? Like what are some of the, pretend I'm one of those people, what, what would you be telling me? Hey, you're good at this and if you practice this, you get better. Right, well, there's, uh, several core components. So one of the things we do is we personalize what we do. So we screen people and use real-time customized feedback uh, to work with a family to pick out what it is uh, that their, their family may be already doing well and is something that they may need to work on. Um, at the heart of our work in focus is helping the family build a story, make meaning out of adversity. I think that's a really important lesson for right now, too. So we individually work with the families to help them reflect on uh, what they've been through in the past, because we know that uh, stress accumulates, but resilience accumulates, too. Um, but also to look at where they are right now and, and make a family plan. So being able to do that reflection, to have empathy and listening, reflective listening across the whole family system, to allow the children to tell their story is often really important in helping the family move forward or, and be able to problem solve together, to be able to set goals together, uh, to be able to regulate all the ups and downs in terms of their emotional life. So we work a lot on skill development around emotional regulation, emotional awareness, um, and how that informs communication. We help families who've been through trauma and loss, we help them work with trauma and loss reminders, the kinds of things that really uh, can 
split a family apart and um, interrupt kids' development. So some of the skills with, that we're teaching are helping them to be able to have challenging conversations and make a family plan to move forward. That's fantastic. So think about it now today, let's say non-military, these families uh, uh, all over the world are scared about going outside. Um, they're scared about potential economic um, right. situations with job loss. There are a lot of families, especially the ones that are uh, working uh, on our team here at Google, have young kids at home and mm -hmm. schools are closed. And so the kids are climbing on top of you and you have to do schooling and parenting right. and right. work. And, um, uh, and it's real anxiety and fear because there is really a tiger out there. Those families, what could you say to them to kind of work on their narrative uh, tonight at dinner? Um, how, how do you how do you how do you kind of do it yourself um, to make sure we learn those lessons that you've learned uh, in your work with focus that I can bring to my family or to other families? Right. Well, I think for parents with kids, um, some of the, the foundational components are uh, figuring out a language to talk about feelings. As you said, they're real worries and they're real fears. And uh, being able to have a strategy for talking about that, for acknowledging your own worry, your own anxiety, um, the kind of ups and downs and moods that we're hearing from everybody. I think, you know, each day comes with its new uh, burden and kind of this unexpected feeling of the wear and tear of going through all of this and not knowing how and where it's going to end. So I think for parents, and you know, I think this is true in couples too, is to be able to have your own opportunity to reflect, to allow yourself to uh, appreciate that the, 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 this is a normal response to a, an, an abnormal situation. Um, and that we're kind of all experiencing this together. And then to be able to talk with your kids and even be able to model sharing those feelings. I mean, sort of the beginning of storytelling is being able to have that kind of communication about your thoughts and feelings, and then be able to have activities that help support it. I mean, in our program, we have a lot of um, structured narrative activities, whether it's building a time map or a timeline or, um, you know, making a family collage. Uh, there's a there's some great activities right now for kids about doing a, a time capsule of this moment um, and thinking about what you would want to include and what what you would want people to know about it. But to do that as a family, I think might be a really useful kind of strategy. But but the but aside from the, those kinds of structured activities, just that day to day collective checking in, maintaining routines talking about your feelings, um, being able to allow yourself to have space, and also for parents uh, to engage in some self-care, uh, that sometimes you need to step away. Like you said, you're suddenly you're a teacher, you're working at home, uh, you're uh, trying to get food on the table in this way that's very different than what you're used to, and really saying, I have to have uh, timeouts from this. I might not be able to do all this coping activities that people are rolling out for me. Maybe I'm not going to be able to make sourdough bread. I'm hearing a lot of that from parents. It's like, I can't do all this. I really just have to take a break and take a walk, um, maintain my sleep, maintain my routines. Another uh, group we're really uh, thinking a lot about and developing targeted services for our first responders and our healthcare workers. Um, with the kind of exposure that they're getting that I think in some ways, unlike the military, they're not really trained to run into okay. danger. Um, and they're certainly not trained to run into danger that might have um, impact on their families, their young children, et cetera. And, so the, and, and to do that without perhaps the kinds of equipment that they need. And so we're really thinking a lot about how to uh, develop targeted strategies that sp support them specifically in the kind of professional well-being needs they have and the potential impact of moral distress and 
uh, professional burnout. And that we're seeing now, you know, sort of individual reports about, have you all been thinking about that too? We certainly have. And so we focus a lot on that uh, healthcare practitioner and what can we do to provide them tools. Um, we, I'm thinking that post COVID, there's going to be a lot of folks with uh, COVID-related medical conditions that have come to the healthcare system. There's mm -hmm. all the acute and chronic conditions that have been delayed, but cancer didn't go away, diabetes didn't go away, that are going to come. There's mm -hmm. going to be this tsunami of mental health um, right. uh, cases showing up, and the healthcare system is going to be totally depleted, and a lot of them, I don't mean to overgeneralize, are going to have PTSD, right? They had to make decisions on ventilators that they never had to make before unless they were in the military. They never had to worry about not having basic equipment. They didn't have to ever worry about bringing disorders home. And they, like everybody else, were worried because at home there was job loss and stress and all and kids at home. I mean, it was a real double whammy. Um, and you're already seeing these healthcare systems, particularly in the U.S., under incredible financial stress. And it's just going to get worse. So we're seeing that. And so our, we think our response is, one, make sure we get good authoritative information, YouTube and search. Mm -hmm. A lot of practitioners come to us before they do a lumbar puncture and they look at a YouTube, right? So we want to make sure we have good information. And then we want to build tools that allow a nurse practitioner to function at a higher level and spend time with their patients. Technologies allow the healthcare workers not to have the burden of the electronic health record but rather a, a very simple user interface that you can find whatever you want and it's really easy, mm -hmm. like we do in the rest of the world. Another group that we're really uh, quite involved in and worried, worried about and thinking about a lot are um, in, in Los Angeles, but I think it's true for all of California, is working with our education colleagues in the schools um, and the incredible mental health burden that they're going to see and thinking about how they can help support a well-being, social, emotional functioning and a tiered strategy for reaching kids and families beyond the walls of the school. And thinking about this as a disruptive moment, perhaps, um, in how education is going to be delivered, just like in perhaps the way uh, mental health care is going to be delivered, um, in, in more of a hybrid and virtually enabled way. Um, but particularly for those kids who've kind of disappeared, I don't know if you've seen the stories about kids that have never, have not checked in virtually, whether they don't have yeah. Wi-Fi, they don't have uh, the technology, the hardware to do it, um, with their immigration concerns, or uh, it's a little unclear the exact makeup of, of all the folks who the schools have, who really just don't know where they are, what's going on with them. And that layered on top of health disparities and all the inequities for, um, I think, the same population who already carry an adversity and trauma burden. We're quite worried about uh, how to reach those kids and uh, support the well-being um, that's COVID related, but it's also, uh, you know, there's a long everything history else. underneath yeah. it. It's everything yeah. else too, exacerbated or perhaps right. revealed by COVID. And oftentimes the school or the soccer coach or the piano teacher is the first one that picks up bruises and protects a kid and, and calls help when you're suspecting, you know, uh, physical or sexual abuse at home those kids there's more stress at home there's with the downturn in the economy there's going to be more of the diseases of despair and these kids are just at higher risk so we definitely got to find those kids and make sure we love them and, and take care of them absolutely hey this was so great to talk with you congratulations on your amazing work i'm always amazed at how you've uh, navigated the military you've been so successful and i know you've uh, uh really positive and the team have pos positively affected so many lives and so grateful for that and so great to connect with you. Congratulations to you too. Thank you for all your good work and your leadership in this area.